Amen. Thank you all so much. Uh, my name is Ryan, and my wife Shasta is right down here. So Shasta came to Shorter um, a little while ago, about 10 years ago, and she really enjoyed her time here. And uh, I just want to practice something uh, for us this morning, all right? So I like feedback. Uh, my church talks to me uh, when I preach, all right? So if I say something that you like, you've got to say amen. So let's practice that. Amen, amen all right? If I say something you don't like, you're going to say, oh, Dr. Barnes, all right? Because we're going to blame this on Corey uh, this morning. But uh, go ahead and take your Bible and turn over to John chapter 4. Uh, John chapter 4 is where we're going to be at this morning in verse 7. And I just want to start out by saying, uh, I want to tell you about a time that literally scarred me for life. Um, when I was in the third grade, third grade was a hard time for me. Uh, it, it was rough. And uh, in that third grade year, uh, we got to go outside and play kickball with all the fifth graders. So um, I was a little guy back then. I was the dorkiest guy you ever would have met. And if you imagine dork, that was me, all right? I just embodied uh, every bit of that. So I go outside, and the bad thing about kickball and the bad thing about sports is that you get picked for teams. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You get picked, and the worst thing is, is when. when. When is the last place to get picked? Last, right? And I was always that kid that was last. So in third grade, I was literally like flesh and bone. So I was doing everything that I could to make myself look stronger. I mean, I was sitting there going like, look at these calf muscles. You know, like I was, I was trying to show off everything. I was like, man, my leg's really strong. I was running around. I had my game face on. And now I look back on that and realize that might be why they didn't pick me, as I freaked some people out back then. But I knew the feeling of feeling left out of something, of being picked last. And I think that in a room this size, there's probably some people in here who know what it's like to feel left out of something. Chances are you can be in a room full of people and feel like you're the only one in the room. You can walk into a cafeteria where there's tons of people and wonder where you're going to sit today because you don't know who you're going to sit with. You walk into a classroom and wonder, who am I going to sit with today? I don't know anybody. School's just kind of fresh and getting started. Where am I going to sit? But think about this. The feeling of feeling left out is one of the worst feelings in the world. Could you imagine having that feeling last, not just for a moment, but for a lifetime and then in eternity? For a lot of people... That is going to be the feeling that they experience. Paul Chitwood put out a tweet this week. He said, from a global population of 7.5 billion people at a rate of 155,252 per day, by the end of your work week, 776,260 people around the world will die with every indication that they will never reach heaven. Could you imagine not just the feeling of being left out for a moment, but the feeling of being left out forever? The interesting thing is that John, when he wrote his gospel, he's writing to a group of people called Gentiles, people like many of, of us, people who were not Jewish. As he's writing to these people, they knew Jesus, that he was, he was a Jewish guy, the son of a Jewish carpenter. And these Gentiles probably experienced a little bit of feeling left out from some of their Jewish brothers and sisters in Jesus. And when they start reading this gospel in the book of John, they're asking the question in their mind, are they really part of this Jesus movement? Are they really part of the kingdom of God? They've, they felt kicked out. They felt pushed away. And I love what John does in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. John looks back on the life of Jesus, and the Holy Spirit puts into his mind this story that we are going to read today, because I think this story not only connects with where we are, but it connects with where so many people are outside of these walls, feeling left out, feeling disengaged, feeling like maybe Jesus is not honestly for them. Or maybe that's you here today, and you're here at school playing sports, you're engaged in academics, but you're asking the question, is Jesus really for me? Because I don't know about you, but sometimes in the Christian church, we can sometimes formulate ideas about what Christians look like, right? How they dress, the bumper stickers they put on their car, the, the music that they listen to, the, the things that they talk about. And, and sometimes in, inside the arena of Christianity, we can feel left out. The story of the Samaritan woman 
so important for us today. Because as these Jews are reading through it, they encounter a woman much like them, a Gentile. And they're asking the question from the story of Nicodemus back in chapter 3, verse 16, does God really love the world? Does that really encompass everybody, or is that only a small group of people? And as we encounter this Samaritan woman and the story unfolds before us, I want us to see all of the connections that Jesus makes through this story. He's going to connect with her. He's going to connect with the disciples. She's going to connect with other people. There's going to be people here all brought together through this one story. And today, if you want to feel like you're not left out, I really believe that you're going to find yourself in this story today. So before we get into the Word of God, let's let's pray together. Jesus, I pray that God, in a room this size, that there's undoubtedly people who, who are around people, but God, they feel all alone. God, undoubtedly, there's people outside these walls that, God, we pass every single day that, God, we are not engaging them in opportunities, Jesus, just as you did this Samaritan woman. And Jesus, those people will be left out. So, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would infuse this time, that you would move in and among us. God, call people to our minds. God, use your word to do your will, God, because just at the end of the story, I'm reminded that your word is what saves. Your word never returns void. Your word is what does the work. So, God, pray that as my voice goes forward, that your word would be so enriching and so powerful that, God, we could not help but leave here today with an encounter with you so that we go out and encounter other people. So, God, help for us to make the connections today. It's your name that we pray. Amen. If you're taking notes today, I want you to write down just a few things that are really important for you today. And the first one is this. Jesus connected with her needs. Jesus connected with her needs. Somebody once said that nobody knows how much you care until they know how much you care, right? You got to have care in there. Nobody knows anything about what you have until you show how much you care. In fact, Maslow, when he made a hierarchy of needs with essentials for survival in life, he had air, food, shelter, sleep, clothing, and water. And water is the thing that Jesus is about to connect with this woman. Jesus, as as God who has limited himself into flesh, is is walking away from the Pharisees after a great baptismal service. And when he's walking away from the Pharisees, is at the noon day, the the sun's at the highest peak, he is tired, he is exhausted, he stops at Jacob's well, and he encounters this woman in verse 7. So look with me at verse 7. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me? a woman of Samaria. For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Verse 10, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is very, very deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. You know, the interesting thing is that this woman has no idea who Jesus is. He's just some man who is thirsty. He's just some man that, that meets her at, at basically her need. And if you know anything about the cultural norms of this day, Jewish men didn't speak to women in public, not even their wives. So ladies, imagine this. You're dating a guy right now. You think he's really, really cute. And then all of a sudden you go out in public and y'all are married and you expect a little peck on the cheek or something and he gives you the cold shoulder when you walk by. How's that going to go when you get home, right? How's that going to go? But think about that in this context, that that men were not supposed to speak to women. Let's take it up another level. Let's think about who Jesus is. He's a great teacher. He's a pure man. He's he's basically following in the footsteps of being an incredible teacher, and, and he's close to the Word of God. He's trying to remain pure. He never would have caught himself alone with a woman. But here he is. Let's take it a little bit deeper as well, and let's think about the fact that she's a Samaritan woman. If you remember from your Bible classes, Samaritan people were, 
were people that Assyria brought into the northern tribe of Israel's territory to, to interbreed with the people, essentially. And now they're, they're half-breed people, is what the Jewish people are calling them. And they're looked down upon because every time a Jewish person meets one of these Samaritans, they remember God disciplined them for not following. God disciplined them in a powerful way that changed the whole course of the nation forever. And every time they encounter a Samaritan, they're reminded of a horrible situation. But somehow Jesus is talking with this woman. Jesus is standing there like she's anybody else. He's having a discussion with her just like he did with Nicodemus, that, that suddenly the person who felt left out suddenly has an integral uh, encounter with Jesus. And, and the encounter is something like every other encounter. And Jesus looks at her and he sees a need that she has. As he looks at that need, he begins to think, okay, it's not just something physical that she needs, but honestly, this woman doesn't just need water. She needs spiritual water. She needs living water. And what is living water anyway? Living water is essentially, it's a term for water that moved in a stream that had a really good flow. That water would have been taken to the temple and used for purification processes. So as he's talking to this woman, he's mentioning to her these things that she should know because she studied the Pentateuch. She knows the first five books of their scriptures. She knows these things. She's heard of these things. She, she's in, interested in all of these things. But the problem for her that we see in the text is she doesn't quite understand what he's getting at because she's so focused on her own desires and her own needs. I want to ask you this question. Have you ever heard of the argument for design? as a reason to prove God's existence. Basically, here, here's how the argument goes. Every natural desire in us corresponds to something in the real world that will match our desire. But the problem is we all have desires that cannot be matched by things in this world. No time, nothing on earth, and no creature can satisfy those desires. And the conclusion is because of our desires, there has to be something outside of time, outside of earth, outside of these creatures that can satisfy our desires. And Jesus takes that argument and then looks at the thirst and takes the, the opportunity for thirst, baptizes it, and gets a great time to share the gospel. I'm reminded of what Billy Graham said, that everyone has a God-shaped hole in their life. Jesus is looking at some desire that she has, and he begins to touch on that desire, that need that she has, as a way to get to sharing the gospel. And you say, Ryan, how do my desires, how are my desires ever met in the gospel? Many of us have a desire for fame. In the gospel, we see that we can be known as a child of God to be co-heirs with Christ. We have desires for companionship. Jesus is yoked to us, just as we heard a moment ago, that he will never leave us. We desire love, that we can be perfectly loved by a perfect God. We have this desire for joy, and we have an opportunity for an abundance of joy through Christ Jesus. We have a desire for peace, that Jesus gives us peace when we don't understand how it can possibly be a thing. We also have a desire for success. And the gospel says it's not about being successful, it's about being obedient. Suddenly the gospel becomes a way that can meet every single need. I want to ask you today, what needs do people have in the lives that are in your inner circle? That are an incredible opportunity, not just for you to give somebody a glass of water, but for you to look at somebody and say, let me tell you how to get living water. Let me show you how that desire matches a spiritual need that you have. He didn't just meet her, though, in her needs. The second thing is that Jesus connected her lifestyle to her worship. Jesus connected her lifestyle to her worship. Jesus has, has started this discussion. She's not really getting everything, but what he wants to do is he wants to get involved in the conversation so much so that he touches her soul. So look down at verse 16 and listen to what Jesus says. Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said, you are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. And the one you're with now is not your husband. What you have said is true. Jesus begins to bring up her past to her in a way that probably brought up some pain. And undoubtedly, 
you've encountered Jesus, there were some things from your past that were brought up that were painful. Jesus, in having this encounter, touches on something that he knew was a fault of her worship because our lifestyles are so connected to how we worship. You say, well, what do you mean? I'm going to explain that in just a moment. But I want you to remember, this woman in this culture, the culture would have only said maximum marriages, two, maybe three. Now, here's what we know. The first two or three could have been the other guy's fault. After about the fourth one, you start asking the question, what's wrong with me <laughs> at that point? You start wondering, why am I continually getting divorced here? Like, what is going on? After the fifth one, she's just done. Everything that she has been going to for meaning in her life, in these relationships, she says, I'm done here. I'm going to a different well for meaning. Then she says in verse 19, she says, the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. <laughs> You can almost hear the sarcasm in her voice. What are you, some type of a psychic or something? She's trying to change the subject to get away from what Jesus is talking about. And it's almost like Jesus anticipated that. And if you've ever had a discussion with somebody and you're trying to tell someone about Jesus, you know what, what happens. When you get into the discussion with them talking about Jesus, it's like they try everything that they can to get you off track of talking about Jesus. They'll talk about their second cousin that was a pastor three times. They'll talk about how they were raised in a Baptist church. They'll talk about they were raised in a Roman Catholic church. They, they talk about all this history of everything that's come up in their life to try and get off track from what we're talking about to get to Jesus. What I love about Jesus is that even though he hears those things, he doesn't get off track. Listen, there's a lot of people who want to argue Bible translation, but arguing about a Bible translation will not win someone to Jesus. Now, arguing about uh, different theological perspectives on multiple different arenas, like when Jesus is going to return, do not win people to Jesus. And the most painful thing for me as a Southern Baptist is not to argue Chick-fil-A versus Popeye's. It will not win people to Jesus. You know what will win people to Jesus? A clear proclamation of the gospel. And what Jesus is getting to is down in verse 23. And look what he says back to this woman in verse 23. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Here, here's what Jesus is getting to. She is trying to argue earlier in the passage about worshiping in one location, one type of way. Jesus says, regardless of where you worship, regardless of how you worship, what we have to be infused with is the work of the Holy Spirit and the truth of the Word of God working in a soul to see someone saved. And you say, Ryan, well, what, what does that impact someone's lifestyle? Have you ever met somebody who can come into service and they can raise hands and sing and then go out and live like a hellion all week? <laughs> that at some point in time, our worship of God has to impact our day-to-day -day life. And for this woman, she's been worshiping all wrong for a long time. What Jesus is trying to get her to see is that when she begins to worship God right, suddenly her lifestyle comes to bear of that. Everything that Jesus said was to reveal himself as the Messiah that she mentioned down in verse 25. By presenting his case this way, he showed her that her failing lifestyle was connected to her faulty worship. If she got her worship right by following the Messiah, she would get her lifestyle right. So Jesus is connected with her needs. He's connected her lifestyle and her worship. And the third thing that he does is he connects workers. Jesus connected workers. You know, for me, um, and there's probably somebody else in here that you're, you're just like me, I get really hung up on results um, in telling somebody about Jesus. I feel like every time that I, I tell someone about Jesus, they should turn their life over to Jesus, right? I mean, I feel like if I don't get someone to say, yes, I want to give my life to Jesus, then, then I'm a failure, that I have failed Jesus somehow. And sometimes that pressure from that can be so overwhelming that I don't even go out and tell someone about Jesus. And I love what Jesus does here because the woman begins to understand that there's some things about this Jesus who she has encountered that she wants other people to encounter this Jesus. And the Bible says that she left her jar there and she went back to her city about a, a half a mile to a mile away back at Shechem. And as she goes over there, the disciples just kind of walk in almost like it's timed, like a TV show. And when they walk in, they bring food to Jesus, and they're talking with Jesus, and, and they ask Jesus, Jesus, won't you eat? 
And look down at verse 20, at 32 for his response. But he said to them, I have no food to eat that you do not know about. Uh, but I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? But here's what happens. Jesus has been talking with a woman about living water, trying to make an impact into this woman's life who has been left out, who has been kind of shunned, kicked to the side. All of a sudden, his disciples come from the same city that she is from, and they don't bring anybody with them back to Jesus. Because all they've been thinking about is getting the food. If you know anything about the route that they would have walked, the Jewish people would have shunned the route that would have taken them right through this city. They hated to go through this city. They would never have dreamed to go here. It's that part of town that you may go there to get the good food, but let's be honest, you're never going to hang out there. That's this part of town. But they went there just to get something. And Jesus is looking back at them, really hoping they're starting to get it. That they're starting to get that this mission that Jesus is on is to invade the world and bring left out people into the kingdom of God. And what happens here is this woman, as she walks away, Jesus gives them an explanation that there are sowers and there are reapers. And the people who sow the gospel, the people who tell people about Jesus, the people who get the fruit, they draw the net, they see someone say that those people all work together. I'm reminded of the story of Jonah, right? When Jonah is, is complaining before God about Nineveh. And God comes back to Jonah and he said, You pity the plant for which you do not labor, nor did you make it grow which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left? I can see Jesus remembering that story and trying to help his disciples to understand, guys, there's a group of people out there you did not labor for that are left out, but I care about them the same as I care about you. Doesn't that sound so much like modern Christianity? Where we can get so concerned about what's going on in our small circles that we forget that we are to invade the darkness. That we forget that we have been commissioned to go out because Jesus has all authority on heaven and on earth has been granted to him and that we are to go and make disciples in the nations. Isn't it so easy to forget that just going throughout our day? But I also want to ask you, have you ever been so excited about what God is doing that you forgot to check your phone? You forgot to eat. You forgot to take a sip of water. Jesus in this moment is so excited that this woman has walked away and gone to get some people that he doesn't need the food because what he has realized is that the greatest food is not just Popeye's and Chick-fil-A. <laughs> the greatest food is doing the will of God. If that is giving him such a high at the moment, such a passion, such an excitement, that all he wants to do is to see the gospel go forward. So he's trying to help them connect to the work. And the final thing that we see that he does in this passage is that Jesus' word changed hearts. Jesus' word changed hearts. Look down with me at verse 39. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. The testimony was that he, he told me all that I ever did. Verse 40 so when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you have said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Did you see it? Did you see it in the passage? A woman who was left out, a woman who felt shunned, a woman who was disconnected, who had no idea of her real needs, suddenly has her needs met in Jesus. And suddenly, the person who had been kicked out from, from her people, the, the woman who showed up at the well at noon because nobody else was there, that she was okay in isolation, suddenly becomes the woman who goes back to a group of people and says, you've got to meet this Jesus who I have encountered. This woman who, who meets Jesus and goes, oh my gosh, he's told me everything that I've done. And they say, we've got to meet this person. So they all come out to meet this Jesus. And when they meet this Jesus, her testimony was an incredible way to build a bridge for them. But ultimately, it was the words of Jesus that convinced them he was the savior of the world. Do you see how the story starts, how the story ends? The question at the beginning Jesus really love all people. 
that sometimes we can feel left out. It ends with an incredible declaration of people who were left out and were brought in to literally say, He's not just the Savior of some people. He's not just the Savior of the people like Him. He's not just the Savior of people like us. He is the Savior of the world. I want to ask you this question today. What does it say about the Savior of the world that we encounter Jesus and never go to the world? What does it say about God being a loving God, a God that saves, a God that redeems, a God that, that frees people from things, a God who gives a new start, a God who is powerful and mighty, that his people can get so closed-minded that we think it's all about us, that we're all going to be right here together and have everything perfect, that we never go to the person who is different than us. What does it say about a God who has encountered us by becoming like us that we would never become like someone else, so that they can encounter God? What does it say about God that he has done incredible work for us on the cross, but yet we will not do an incredible work in just going to our neighbor and saying, let me tell you what God has done in me. What does it say, not just about God, but what does it say about the validity of our encounter with God? Throughout the whole New Testament, someone who encounters Jesus leaves differently, and they get people and bring them back to Jesus so that they can be different. And this wrecked me this week. Can I tell you, as a pastor, it's extremely easy to sit in my office, study this word all day long, and forget about the hundreds, of thousands of people who I see every day that will die and never enter heaven. Because I have left them out. But when I look at the story of the Samaritan woman, I see a powerful reminder. An encounter with Jesus is so that we will encounter others. Many of us here today have encountered Jesus, but we've never introduced someone to Jesus. I want to encourage you. Find one person, just one. Pray for them. Tell them about Jesus. Many of us have encountered Jesus, but we need to change some things in our lifestyle. We've got to learn how to worship Jesus. It starts with getting into his word and, and asking him to help us every single day. Many of us have encountered Jesus, but we don't know our place in encountering others because we've never served him. I encourage you, find a local church. Get busy. Serve that church. Find your giftings. Use your giftings for the kingdom of God. Finally, I wonder if maybe you're here today and you've never encountered Jesus. Extremely easy. Jesus came to encounter you. He did that by coming and taking up a, a body, living 33 years on the earth, being sinless, going to a cross to die for you and for me. And on that cross, he took our punishment. It's like being guilty and going to a judge and the judge saying, hey, I'll take your punishment for you. And then not just taking the punishment, but letting us off scot-free and giving us a brand new start at life. I did that through the resurrection. So that everyone who believes in our heart and confesses with our mouth, we will be saved. If you want to encounter Jesus today, it's as simple as asking Jesus to save you, committing your life to him, to becoming the Lord of your life. I believe Jesus is going to do an incredible work, an incredible thing in your life as you encounter him, and he uses you to encounter people who are left out. Jesus, I pray that, God, you would help for us to be your people. Jesus, I pray that you would help for us to encounter the world, God, who has been left out of so many things that, God, you have given us all authority in heaven and earth to go and reach them and make disciples in the nations. So God, help for us today here, even at, at Shorter University, God, to encounter people who feel left out and to God, to bring them into the kingdom. And God, if we feel left out, to get busy serving you. And Jesus, we pray this in your name. Amen.